Back in October of 2021, I posted a video on this channel responding to the popular Marxist-Leninist YouTuber Hakim. In his video, he claimed that socialism was scientifically better, and then proceeded to demonstrate that he doesn't even know what science is. My video was quite a thorough debunking of his, but today I think I know far more than I knew two years ago. So today we're going to go over his video again, and I'm going to show you some of the additional information I've learned. But before we start, I would like you to go watch this video by Liquid Zulu. This video will start you off with the theory so you can understand why the data is the way that it is. After you watch that, come back and finish this video. Hello. You've probably seen this study around. Economic Development, Political Economic System, and the Physical Quality of Life by Saraceto and Waitskin. I won't go through this study again today as I've already done so twice, but the gist of it is this. The study empirically shows that under equal levels of development, socialist countries consistently scored higher on quality of life based on actual life indicators, access to healthcare, education, employment, minority rights, nutritional intake, etc. In response to this, it seems there have been a handful of quote-unquote responses. I hesitate to even call them that as they're more like incoherent diatribes against concepts they fail to understand, but oh well. Seeing as this is the case, I thought I'd put their criticism in context, show how it's fallacious, and also discuss some more studies on the superiority of socialism, if we have the time. I didn't even know people were talking about this till someone sent me a thread by a Reddit user named Hyasa Bruzzi, so thanks, Hayui. With that said though, let's get started. Now, their arguments can be broken down into several. They either criticize the age of the paper, claim the data used is somehow not correctly interpreted, that this or that apparently socialist country is listed as a capitalist one, ooh, and a general lack of understanding of definitions amongst other things. Let's deal with them one by one. Argument number one. The socialists skewed the data. Citation needed. In 1989, a few years after the publication of Hakim's favorite pseudoscientific study, two Soviet economists published the book The Turning Point, revitalizing the Soviet economy. In this book, they thoroughly documented the outright fabrication of data by the Soviet government. On page 30, they say, statistics are also distorted by outright falsification of data. Not long ago, the entire country was outraged by the cotton affair. In Uzbekistan, cotton production was overstated by a full million tons, almost 20% of actual production. They go on to say, the Soviet Institute of the Economy estimates that as much as 3% of industrial production and from 5 to 25% of raw material output is falsified. They go into several specific examples such as grain production, saying that it was clearly overstated and that hopper weight is sometimes 25 to 30% higher than the actual weight. They go on to say, it is utterly clear that official data on the economic growth of the USSR in the last 60 years require major revision. In the book, The Economic Transformation of the Soviet Union, the scholars S.G. Wheatcroft and R.W. Davies explain why these distortions happened. Speaking about the Soviet government, they sought to know the truth about the economic situation in the country, particularly in relation to successes and failures in pursuing their key priorities but they also sought to reward achievements and penalize failure with the aid of their knowledge of the quantitative results achieved by individual economic units and by whole sectors of the economy. This gave strong incentives to participants in the system at every level to exaggerate their reported results. And these central authorities were not always able to correct this deficiency adequately. Moreover, these central authorities and the competing interests within the party and within the state apparatus were all willing to distort statistics in their own interests. In 2003, in the 55th volume of Europe-Asia Studies, John Howard Wilhelm writes, The view that Soviet statistics were not deliberately distorted is not supported by what we now know. Throughout the Soviet period, statistics were deliberately distorted both at the top and at lower levels. All of these things have been known for quite some time. Hakim is being deliberately disingenuous. Either that or he did no research into Sovietology. If you're going to cite sources that are prior to the fall of the Soviet Union, you have to be very selective in who you cite, because many people got things really wrong. In my YouTube and TikTok videos, as well as my articles, I try to cite alternative scholars on the Soviet Union, such as Iger Berman. In his book, Personal Consumption in the USSR and the USA, it provides great rebuttals to the claims of communists that the CIA showed the Soviets ate more food than Americans. 
In Wilhelm's paper, he also writes, Berman clearly did get it right. His estimations of the size of the Soviet budget deficit turned out to be quite close to later Soviet revelations. He was right about the state of the Soviet economy and its subsequent collapse. And increasingly, the evidence which has emerged indicated that Berman had been right all along in his criticism of Soviet data, as well as the Western estimates, especially the CIA's. The study uses the World Bank's own data that has been corrected or readjusted by them specifically. The World Bank wasn't a tentacle of the socialist movement, that's for sure, so unless you're into that sort of conspiratorial thinking, the data is fine. By their own admission, and I quote, the World Bank's statistical reporting tends to be conservative, in the sense that overly enthusiastic statistics reported from specific countries are appraised and readjusted to obtain more accurate figures. More importantly, the data are readily available for inspection and reanalysis by other scholars. By the way, corrupt bureaucrats fiddling data to look better is an argument that goes both ways. In fact, unlike the nebulous claim it is for socialist countries, we know for a fact that capitalists regularly fiddle data. This part is just a copium overdose. Hakim asserts that they corrected the statistics and pretends to be citing the World Bank, but actually what he's citing is the very paper he's defending. He gives no evidence that they correctly adjusted the statistics and just asserts that it is true. We already established that he didn't realize there was many intentional distortions from the Soviet Union. And of course, this is true with other socialist countries even today. The evidence for this is overwhelming. There is a strong correlation between countries being socialist and them fabricating their own data. And despite what Hakim wants to think, the evidence for this, again, is overwhelming. He brings up the silly example of Rwanda and acts like that proves capitalist countries always distort their statistics. But the statistical distortions that come out of Rwanda are largely due to the large role that the government has in their economy. So this is actually an argument in my favor. Argument number two, it's an old paper. You're right, it is indeed an old paper, and sadly, many of the nations compared are now capitalist countries with vastly worse outcomes thanks directly to capitalist efforts at sabotaging and destabilizing them. This point largely ties into the first point. That is, the old age of these statistics means they are much more unreliable. And I have already demonstrated why that is. We could do this study again today using the exact same sample of countries in the exact same years. But there's really no point in doing that because the entire premise of this study is ridiculous to begin with. Mushing a bunch of vastly different countries into one category and pretending you can compare them and that means socialism is better or even capitalism is better is just ridiculous. We need to know if these individual countries would be better or worse off under socialism or capitalism. Because, of course, there are many other factors besides the specific economic system that they have. In the study in the low-income countries, they compare 33 capitalist countries to one socialist country, the socialist country being China. The capitalist countries have a wide range of GNP per capita from $80 to $530. Socialist China comes in at $300. Recent post-revolutionary is also a category, although these countries are excluded from the socialist sample. These exclusions make sense until you consider the full context. Post-revolutionary countries are deemed to not have been socialists for long enough to actually be included in the socialist data set, but this same standard is never applied to capitalist countries. Afghanistan is one of the countries included under post-revolutionary. Afghanistan was in the middle of the ravaging Soviet-Afghan war, which would have skewed the data away from the socialist favor. However, Chad is still included as a capitalist country, despite it being in the midst of the Chadian-Libyan conflict. A conflict that can be blamed on socialism and the Soviet Union, ironically enough. When formulating an empirical conclusion on which economic system is superior, we need far more controls than this. Many factors such as geography, religion, wars, can affect economic growth and physical well-being. In this study, almost every country under the capitalist category is located in Africa, while almost none of these socialist countries are from the continent. Africa not only has some of the more harsh geographies, but this historical period was filled with war and conflicts. The Lebanon War, the 1982 Kenyan coup d'etat, the 1982 Central African Republic coup attempt, the Ethiopian-Somali border war, that's just to name a few. 
Geography is often overlooked as a major factor in economic development. A majority of these capitalist countries in Africa or the Middle East are landlocked, while China has almost 10,000 miles of coastline. Gallup et al. 1989 suggests that location and climate, through their impacts on transportation costs, the burden of disease, and agricultural productivity, have significant effects on development. And according to the United Nations, overall the level of development in landlocked developing countries is about 20% lower than it would be if they were not landlocked. If every country on earth had the exact same economic system, beat by beat, we would see different levels of development, and this is quite obvious. So that's why we need to control for other factors and not just the economic system. In 2018, three researchers published a paper titled Deep Cultural Ancestry and Human Development Indicators Across Nation States. The purpose of this paper was to explore how historical connections, events, and cultural proximity affected human development. The paper examined 44 Eurasian countries using language ancestry as a proxy for cultural relatedness and controlling for geographical proximity, religion, and former communism. Using a greater array of control variables means they were more likely to see the true effects of a particular variable than if they were making surface level observations and correlations. The authors point out, geography and the associated environmental variation has often been cited as a factor that may limit or impede development. For example, the problems posed by a lack of waterways for inland continental areas and the difficulties of the tropical climate have been cited as reasons why certain areas had low levels of human development. And the authors go on to discuss communism as a variable, pointing out that communism significantly negatively predicts the human development index, income index, and health indexes. They say the results support a significant effect of communist history on the human development of countries, comparable to the effects of geography. And they say it's even more important than the effects of culture or religion. So this study is kind of similar to the study that the socialists cite, in that it looks at many of these same socialist countries, or as it calls them, communists. But it is much more statistically rigorous, and actually controls for other variables, and gives us a much more accurate view on the effects that communism had on these countries. And the data is quite clear. It was overwhelmingly negative. Argument number three. Ex-socialist countries listed as capitalist. Yeah, no. Just because some party calls itself socialist doesn't make it socialist. There are real definitions that reflect realities on the ground. And no... When the government does stuff. ...isn't socialism for the love of God. If that were true, then that would mean literally every country on earth is socialist and that capitalism has never been tried. I swear being a libertarian just makes your brain rot or something. In my original response video, I just focused on a few examples because I felt like it would take quite some time to go over each country mentioned in the study and see if they should be considered socialist. But since then, I've had time to do exactly that. I mainly utilized Wikipedia's list of socialist countries, but I also did some of my own independent research into some of these countries. My takeaway was that Chad, Burma, Mali, Uganda, India, Somalia, Tanzania, Guinea, Benin, Sierra Leone, Madagascar, Sudan, Senegal, Yemen, Zambia, Egypt, Congo, Tunisia, and Syria are all falsely labeled as capitalist. And rest assured that I tried to be very good faith about this, because many more of these countries are listed as socialist on the Wikipedia list of socialist countries. I just went through each individual one and made sure they were much closer to the Marxist-Leninist interpretation of socialism and not just social democracies. Several other countries explicitly call themselves socialists in their constitution, but I felt like their policies themselves were inadequate to be labeled as a majority socialist. But many of the countries I just listed, on the other hand, were explicitly planned economies or ran their economy through, quote, scientific socialism and nearly all of them were one-party states. And as you can see in this image, the 18 falsely labeled countries are overwhelmingly in the low-income category. There's actually a strong correlation between being falsely labeled as capitalists and being lower income. Huh, isn't that weird?
Syria, not a socialist country, never had a centrally planned economy, and in fact the Syrian Ba'ath Party was beginning to liberalize the economy during the era. Syria most definitely was a socialist country. Section 1, Article 8 of the Constitution at the time, the leading party in the society and the state is the Socialist Arab Ba'ath Party. It leads a patriotic and progressive front, seeking to unify the resources of the people's masses and place them at the service of the Arab nation's goals. And of course, as I've pointed out in the past, in the book Syria, A Country Study, they extensively document Syria's shift to socialism. By 1986, the situation remained essentially unchanged. As a result of these earlier measures, the government dominated the economy, accounting for three-fifths of GDP, and exerted considerable influence over the private sector. And as I pointed out last time, this liberalization that Hakim is talking about occurred after the study period, so it was completely irrelevant for him to bring it up. But what about Burma? What about the Burmese road to socialism, hmm? Yeah, again, a ruling socialist party doesn't make it socialist. You need to look at the concrete policies taken. As I pointed out last time, this is a straw man on Hakim's part, because I never said Burma was socialist because of a ruling socialist party. From 1962 to 1988, Burma was under a plan called the Burmese Way to Socialism. In February of 1963, the Enterprise Nationalization Law was decreed. All major industries were nationalized, including oil, banks, newspapers, and more. Over 15,000 private firms were nationalized, and Burma became a Soviet-style planned economy. To say that Burma was not socialist is to lie, purposefully. The same goes for all of the other socialist nations that Hakim dismisses for no reason. It's almost like Hakim and the people like him love to cover up examples of socialism done by brown people. I wonder why that is. We'll leave it up to speculation. Sarasata and Waitzkin's research has been recreated as well. Another study, The Political and Economic Determinants of Health Outcomes, a cross-national analysis by Lena and London, studied the conclusions of the aforementioned study, redid the analyses, and had this to say in their conclusion. To quote, Our more fully specified models yield findings that are quite congruent with those of the earlier researchers. In other words, our results complement and strengthen the conclusions presented by Sarasato and Waitzkin. This study has many of the same limitations as the first study, and it might actually be worse, largely because of the definitions, as in the definitions are almost non-existent. I'm still very confused on how they're actually classifying the nations, but I'll show you all the nations that are included in this study. You'll notice a distinct lack of developed capitalist countries, but when we look at table one and actually compare these regimes with the different health outcomes, you see that the right regime norms outperforms both left regime categories in almost every health outcome, specifically infant mortality and child death rate. The left regime strength outperforms in life expectancy, but as the next scholar that Hakim cites says, mortality is not necessarily a good measure of the effectiveness of a healthcare system. Life expectancy statistics are much more complex than that. With all that being said, though, these aren't the only two studies either. There are quite a few, actually, it's just really tedious going through academic papers, especially when they're well written. Long quotes with little substance added by me is somewhat boring, in my opinion. Regardless, we can break that rule just for the hell of it this time. Another great study is Has Socialism Failed? An Analysis of Health Indicators Under Socialism. This paper, again, has many of these same limitations as the previous paper. A lack of control variables and endogenous selection bias. It also mislabels countries, just like the previous two papers. And there are even more issues, which we will get into in one moment. Broken down by continent, we start with Latin America. Cuba started with similar, if not worse, indicators than most Latin American countries, and under socialism, and relentless embargo by the US, pretty much matched or outmatched all of them. In many indicators, it exceeded the US as well. Life expectancy, literacy, infant mortality, lowest levels of malnutrition. So much for haha, <laughs> communism, no food. This is more lies and disingenuous arguments from Hakim, and it's actually a great example as to why that previous paper is incorrect. He tries to claim that Cuba performed relatively poorly to other countries prior to being socialist. However, this is the exact opposite of the truth. In the paper Renaissance and Decay, a comparison of socioeconomic indicators in pre-Castro and current-day Cuba, the authors note that 
Cuba's infant mortality rate of 32 per 1,000 live births in 1957 was the lowest in Latin America and the 13th lowest in the world. This is according to UN data. Cuba ranked ahead of France, Belgium, West Germany, Israel, Japan, Austria, Italy, Spain, and Portugal, all of which would eventually overtake Cuba in this indicator in the following decades. The paper also discusses Cuba's literacy rate, pointing out that their improvement was impressive but not unique among Latin American countries. Panama, which ranked just behind Cuba in this indicator during the 1950s, has matched Cuba's improvement. In fact, a review of the UN statistics reveals that the whole hemisphere has made enormous strides in literacy over the past 40 years. Again, Cuba was performing well prior to the socialist revolution in many different indicators. This means that Cuba's quote unquote success came in spite of socialism and not because of it. And prior to socialism, it came in spite of the Batista dictatorship not because of it. In 1948, Cuba's daily supply of calories per person was 2,814. In 1980, it was 2,893. In 1993, it was 2,321. And in 1999, it was 2,898. This is a clear indicator that Cuba did not do better off because of socialism. Now, for a few minutes, I want us to return to infant mortality rates. I already established, clearly, that Cuba's infant mortality rate is not good because of socialism. But I want to double down and add further data that proves my point. We're going to look at some synthetic control studies. As Wikipedia states, the synthetic control method is a statistical method used to evaluate the effects of an intervention in comparative case studies. It involves the construction of a weighted combination of groups used as controls, to which the treatment group is compared. This comparison is used to estimate what would have happened to the treatment group if it had not received the treatment. In other words, we take a country like Cuba and estimate where a variable like infant mortality rate would have been if a particular scenario had not happened, in this case, the socialist revolution. So, where would Cuba's infant mortality rate be if the revolution never happened? In order to figure this out, we have to look at previous trends in the infant mortality rate, as well as the trends of similarly situated countries. In the paper, The Cuban Revolution and Infant Mortality Rate, a Synthetic Control Approach, the authors do exactly that. And they find that the 1959 revolution increased infant mortality rate, not decreased it. They use the synthetic control approach to create a counterfactual Cuba where the revolution never happened and Castro never got in power. They find that Cuba's infant mortality rate would have kept falling as it was pre-1999, faster than how it actually fell. They tried numerous specifications by changing donor pools, changing data sets, and they always got similar results. They even accounted for the effects of the US embargo and they found no effects of the embargo on these health indicators. So, let me restate just one more time. The Cuban Revolution, socialism, made infant mortality rates get worse, not better. And lucky for us, we do have an additional synthetic control analysis that looks at economic performance in Cuba before and after the revolution. And again, I do want to clarify that synthetic control analyses allow us to control for many different variables and can give us much more accurate insights on the effects of these policies. This is much better than just taking Cuba and comparing it to any random country and saying that means socialism worked. This is comparing Cuba to itself. It's looking at the actual effects of these socialist policies on Cuba. And what the authors found is that the institutional changes made by the socialist government are what caused a divergence in GDP per capita when compared to the rest of Latin America. Meaning, the socialist revolution made Cuba worse off economically. And again, this paper also accounts for the effects of the embargo. Specifically, the authors cite a book, Market, Socialists, and Mixed Economies, which has great details on Cuba's economic history. The author notes that one of the revolution's major targets was to reduce economic dependency on the United States. 
and it did exactly that. They opened up trade agreements with the Soviet Union, and the Soviets bought 1 million tons of sugar annually. They also supplied oil, machinery, and chemicals, as well as opening up a credit line for $100 million to supply needed capital goods, construct factories, and undertake geological exploration. In mid-1960, U.S. refineries refused to process imports of Soviet oil crude. Hence, they were nationalized and began to refine Soviet oil. By the end of that year, practically all Cuba's oil was imported by the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union and China both made commitments to buy, at world market prices, most of Cuba's sugar. Soviet imports of Cuban sugar were actually higher than the island's loss of U.S. imports, and of all socialist imports combined, significantly surpassed U.S. imports in the early part of that year. What this means is that the Soviet Union, China, and other socialist countries replaced the U.S. as Cuba's trading partner. That means the embargo initially had no negative effects on Cuba. You wouldn't really see any of the negative effects until after the fall of the Soviet Union. Another major country in Asia with a great diversity of nationalities is the former Soviet Union. A comparison of the Asiatic republics of the USSR with comparable countries on their borders shows that health indicators are much better in what used to be the Socialist Republic of the USSR than in the bordering capitalist countries, even though these indicators were equally poor before socialism was established in the USSR. An important point, I feel, as most people always jump to comparing the USSR to the US, a country built on enslavement and genocide that had over a century of uninterrupted development ahead of the USSR, and of course, we all know the USSR was absolutely not built off of genocide and slavery. That's definitely not the case, right guys? Anyways, the USSR is definitely a fun one. I love studying Sovietology. We already went over some of the indicators of the Soviet Union and how many of them were quite off and overstated. And of course, which country isn't here today? Oh right, the Soviet Union. Now, in the book Back in the USSR by Jose Puente, he cites a 2016 paper by several economists looking into whether or not Stalin was necessary for Russia's economic development. This shows us whether or not the socialist policies that were implemented by Stalin were good for Russia and the surrounding countries. The paper is very similar to the aforementioned synthetic control models. And of course, their answer to was Stalin necessary was a definitive no. Even though they don't consider the tragedies of famine, repression, and terror, and focus solely on economic outcomes, while also making assumptions that are biased in Stalin's favor, his economic policies underperform the counterfactual. He also notes that in their analysis, they show that extending Tsarist Russia into the future would have resulted in lower growth. However, it would have resulted in higher welfare. Secondly, if Russia had implemented liberalization reforms in the Tsarist economy instead of communism, then it would have been far superior to Stalinism. And two other models which would have been superior to Stalinism would be the Japanese growth model, as well as the new economic policy. Additionally, I want to note that the common socialist talking point of Eastern Europe and Russia being in abject poverty and staying in abject poverty before the socialist revolution is complete nonsense. Looking at poverty lines, you can see poverty was decreasing long before the Socialist Revolution. One of the most major factors in Russia's development specifically was the abolition of serfdom in 1861. It had a substantial positive effect on agricultural productivity, industrial development, and peasants' nutrition in the 19th century. It led to about a 17.7% increase in Russia's GDP in the second half of the 19th century. The authors of this paper also find evidence to suggest that if Russia had transferred ownership rights over to peasant households rather than communes, the results might have been even better. In other words, if Russia had become more capitalist instead of more socialist, it would have been vastly better. And of course, after Tsarist Russia, when the Soviets took over, they experimented with something called war communism. War communism is much closer to what many communists advocate for, they attempted to abolish money and property rights entirely. However, this was an abject failure. In the book, The Russian Revolution, 1917 to 1921, by William Henry Chamberlain, he notes that, considered purely as an economic experiment, war communism may fairly be considered one of the greatest and most overwhelming failures in history. 
every main branch of economic life, industry, agriculture, transportation, experienced conspicuous deterioration and fell far below the pre-war levels of output. The quality of goods that were produced was indescribably bad. Productivity of labor declined enormously. Agriculture reverted to the most primitive type of subsistence economy. In Alec Nove's book, An Economic History of the USSR, 1917 to 1991, he points out that gross output of all industries dropped by almost 70%. With large-scale industries, it was almost 80. Other factors like imports and exports dropped by indescribable amounts. Further research you can take a look at includes those appearing on the screen now. This isn't even all of it, but the record is fairly clear. Unlike the Mickey Mouse research funded by literal oil company barons and right-wing think tanks, market liberalization, privatization, and severe austerity on already poor populations doesn't make a country prosperous. It just makes those that fund that research prosperous. So this is, of course, a really bad source list. I've already debunked some of the stuff in this source list, especially the things concerning the Soviet Union and Cuba, but I will link additional sources that refute these. For the Soviet Union things, the book I cited earlier, back in the USSR, it refutes virtually everything here. And for Cuba, I already have a few sources concerning that. My favorite part is the fact he cites the little CIA paper. This thing I've already written articles refuting, and I sort of made a reference to it earlier in the video. The fact that he cites this as a success of socialism shows that Hakim is a very unserious person. I am also going to cite some additional sources, just like Hakim did, and unlike him, I'm going to briefly cover what they are. The first one is The Socialist System, a book by Janos Kornai. In this book, he does a great job taking down the economy of the Soviet Union and the Soviet satellite states. He also compares these socialist countries to capitalist countries and shows that they underperform. There's also the book Market, Socialist, and Mixed Economies, which I did cite in the video. This book has a really great section on Cuba, looking at Cuba's economic history, and it also has one looking at Chile and Chile's liberalization period. There's also the book The Power of Capitalism by historian Reiner Zittelman. This gives a great economic and social history of countries like China, the US, Venezuela, Germany, North and South Korea. There's also the book Socialism, The Failed Idea That Never Dies. This book covers the Soviet Union, China under Mao, Cuba under Castro, and it has an especially great chapter on Venezuela. And speaking of Venezuela, here's a paper, The Economic Consequences of Hugo Chavez, a Synthetic Control Analysis. This is a case study of the impact of Hugo Chavez on the Venezuelan economy. They compare outcomes under Chavez's leadership and policies against a counterfactual of, quote, business as usual in similar countries. They find that relative to their control, per capita income fell dramatically. While poverty, health, and inequality outcomes all improved during the Chavez administration, these outcomes also improved in each of the corresponding control cases, and thus we cannot attribute the improvement to Chavismo. We conclude that the overall economic consequences of the Chavez administration were bleak. And of course, the socialists also try to blame the failures of Venezuela on sanctions, the evil sanctions. But this paper from the Brookings Institute demonstrates that the sanctions did not cause these economic failures. And there is another paper that goes over Venezuela, the economic consequences of durable left populist regimes in Latin America. This paper not only looks at Venezuela, but also Nicaragua, Bolivia, and Ecuador and shows significantly bad effects, on, especially on national income and per capita GDP from these countries' socialist regimes. Socialists sometimes cite Bolivia under Evo Morales as a success of socialism. However, the paper Skill versus Luck, Bolivia and its recent Bonanza demonstrates that favorable economic outcomes came from external conditions and not from Morales' policies. And his policies actually caused more harm than good. The paper Macroeconomic Populism by Sebastian Edwards and Dornbush looks at Chile under Allende and Peru under Garcia and demonstrates the failure of their economic systems. And on the opposite end of things, the paper Assessing Economic Liberalization Episodes, a Synthetic Control Approach, looks at the effects of liberalization policies on third world countries mainly countries in Asia, Latin America, and Africa. They find that economic liberalization tends to have a by and large positive or at least non-negative impact on the trajectory of real income per capita. And finally, I'll throw an additional over 100 more studies at you. 
the paper Economic Freedom of the World, an Accounting of the Literature, looks at the effect of economic freedom on various life indicators. Economic freedom, of course, is the classical liberal tradition that emphasizes the importance of private property, rule of law, free trade, sound money, and a limited role for government. Higher scores are accorded to nations with more secure property, freer trade, more stable money and prices, less government spending, and fewer regulations. The economic freedom variables correlated positively with good dependent variables or negatively with bad dependent variables. Only 8 out of the 198 papers found significant negative results associated with economic freedom, while over two-thirds of the studies, 134 out of 198, found economic freedom corresponding with good outcomes, such as faster growth, better living standards, more happiness, etc. So it is quite clear that the evidence overwhelmingly supports the capitalist side. And as I said in the beginning, you can go check out Liquid Zulu's video about the economic calculation problem and see why these outcomes actually happen. Anyways, thank you guys for watching. I'm sorry I haven't uploaded in so long. You will definitely be seeing more from me on YouTube in the coming year.